Oke, okay, sekarang sudah live. Boleh segera dimulai. Terima kasih. Greeting friends from wherever you are. Welcome to the International Webinar Ambassador and Young Leaders Week 2020. With me, Christiana Marta Deborah, who will accompany our great speakers and moderator as the master of ceremonies during this event. The theme of this event will discuss new normal. This event will take over three hours from 1 p.m. until 4 p.m. Jakarta time, which will be moderated by Mr. Kairul Anam, President of PPI Czech Republic for the first session, and Mr. Aldila Putra Ramadan, President of PPI Sri Lanka for the second session. For your information, this event aims to stimulate a sense of awareness of the significance of international competitiveness, extensive networking, and global collaboration among Indonesian people. The ultimate goal is to overcome the present-day global crisis and seek for an opportunity to lead the world, case study COVID-19 and its domino effects. More of this event objectives are elaborated as follows. Sharing the world best practice and strategic scenarios against COVID-19 and its domino effects. Second, promoting OISA young leaders to the world. Furthermore, please allow me to introduce our great speakers for today's session. First, we have Mr. Tantowi Yahya, Ambassador of Indonesia to New Zealand. And second, we have Mr. Husin Bagid, Ambassador of Indonesia to Uni Arab Emirates. And third, we have Mr. Umar Hadi, Ambassador of Indonesia to South Korea. And last, we have Mr. Johannes Kristiarto Suryo Legowo, Ambassador of Indonesia to Australia. Before we begin, I would like to inform you that in this event, we're also raising funds for COVID-19 especially for our medical team who are at the forefront in fighting COVID-19. If you want to donate, please revert to the bank account number or scan the QR code as shown below or on your screen. Thank you very much to all of you who have contributed to the donation. Without further ado, I will pass the event to our moderator, Mr. Kairul Anam and Mr. Aldila Putra. The stage is yours. Thank you very much, Christina Marta, uh, for giving us the time. It's my pleasure to lead you in this session. First of all, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Hoira Anam. I am a PhD student in uh, Uni Charles University in Prague. And I will be serving as moderator at this first session today with the Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenty Plenty Potentiary. Tantowiahya. Good afternoon, Mr. Ambassador. Hi, good afternoon, Hyrule. How are you? I'm good. How about you, Mr. Ambassador? <laughs> Hopefully, yeah, you look great today. <laughs> you, look, you really look good and fresh. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. <laughs> okay, I will read our event background before Mr. Tantowiahya deliver his presentation. There will be a question and answer session discussion with the speaker after the presentation. And for those who have a question, please write your name and your country followed by the question. And we will choose the best question from the audience to, for the speaker to answer. Okay, uh, now we invite our speaker, Mr. Santawiyahya, and I will give you 15 minutes to deliver your presentation, Mr. Ambassador. The stage is yours. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to be one of the speakers in this uh, very important uh, webinar held by the uh, World uh, Associations of uh, Indonesian uh, Students Alliance. Uh, as, requested, as requested by the committee, so I have uh, prepared a very brief uh, presentation on the success story of uh, the government of New Zealand in fighting uh, COVID-19 or in eliminating uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. I'll, I'll try to make it uh, as, as brief as possible so that uh, 
we have uh, much time for question and answers because I'm sure uh, a lot of uh, participants uh, already have some questions to ask to me regarding the success story of the uh, government of uh, New Zealand. So the uh, title of my presentation is uh, Eliminating COVID-19 Lesson uh, from New Zealand. Uh, before I begin with the first page, I would like to uh, convey my uh, happiness and pride of being the ambassador posted in a very small country like New Zealand, who over the years, over the three years, uh, enjoyed uh, two big crises. The first one is the shooting in Christchurch on the 15th of March last year which killed 50 innocent Muslims and injured uh, 49 uh, uh, innocent Muslims. The, this first crisis happens only in the first years of the government uh, of uh, Justin Ardern's coalition's uh, led uh, parties. And uh, as you know, uh, if this crisis was not managed very well, it had the potentials to uh, corner uh, this country or to put this country in a very bad situation knowing the casualties was uh, quite big. And the second crisis is the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. The difference between uh, the first crisis and the second one, the first one is a man-made crisis because it's a terrorist attack. And the second one, as you know it, is a global crisis. Now, uh, as everybody knows that in both crises, uh, the government of New Zealand turned out to be the champions. So they managed to, uh, they, man they, uh, they were able to manage the crisis very, very well. And uh, they get uh, uh, appreciations from, not only from their people, but also from the international world. Now, uh, being an ambassador posted in a country that experienced uh, difficulties in, in the two crises, of course, uh, I learned a lot and I would like to share with you uh, uh, what I observed, uh, the factors that create uh, uh, success uh, to the government of uh, this uh, small but beautiful country. Okay. All right. Uh, in fact, uh, there are five key success factors behind uh, the two crises that uh, this country has been able to manage. And uh, let's go straight to the uh, uh, key success factors of the government of New Zealand in uh, eliminating COVID-19. The first one is the uh, geographical advantage. The, first, the second one is the uh, national leadership. The third is uh, strong border controls. Four is consistent and clear messaging. And the fifth one is the uh, people's uh, participations. So from this uh, slide, uh, you guys can learn uh, how these uh, five uh, elements become interdependent uh, factors that uh, lead this country uh, into a success. So forget about the, uh, the uh, 12 uh, cases that happened in the last five days, forget about it. But before it happened, New Zealand was uh, pronounced as uh, the first country that was able to, to free themselves from uh, the virus. And this is the fact that everybody here was very, very proud of. And so to speak, uh, the government enjoyed uh, a very big applaud from its people. And uh, it, of course, uh, elevated it, uh, the uh, political uh, standing of the current government because it's not easy to uh, navigate uh, a country like New Zealand in a crisis like uh, COVID-19, but yet, uh, they, uh, they came up to be uh, the champions before uh, some new cases that happened in the last uh, five days. And I would like to begin uh, with uh, the first uh, factor, which is geographical advantage. 
Uh, we all understand that uh, New Zealand is a very small country uh, and it's a very, uh, it's a very remote country. It's uh, far from everywhere. Uh, after New Zealand, there is no more country. Uh, after New Zealand, it's the South Pole. Uh, in many cases, uh, living in a country which is very remote and far from uh, everywhere creates uh, disadvantages. But also, but uh, uh, on 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 the other side, being a country which is remote, which is remote, also uh, uh, gives you advantage advantages. Uh, for instance, like uh, uh, the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic. So being the country which is uh, far from everywhere, I should say this is one of the furthest country in the world, and by itself it becomes the country that uh, in that was uh, infected uh, by the virus the last. Uh, the issue about the uh, COVID-19 uh, began or the, the outbreak uh, began uh, on December in China, but uh, the first uh, infections in New Zealand uh, only happened uh, two months later. So the first case in uh, New Zealand was in the 28th of February. So the benefit of being uh, the last country to get infected the virus means that you have enough lead time. So two months give them enough time to get prepared. So talking about preparedness, uh, New Zealand and many other countries in the Pacific who are uh, located uh, geographically at the same at the same positions, they benefit a lot because they have enough time to observe, to learn the best practice, and to learn the bad practice done by uh, countries that got uh, 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 infected uh, before them. Now, uh, the two uh, the lead time of a two months give uh, this country. I'm talking about the government enough time to to do coordinations with all the stakeholders and then prepared all the infrastructures needed in order to fight uh, the virus when uh, it comes uh, to the land. Now, uh, geographical advantage also uh, uh, gives uh, the government of this country a lead time or enough time to make a collective awareness on COVID-19. In a time of a crisis like, uh, like this, it's uh, very essential to get uh, or uh, to create awareness about the danger of the virus. And it happens. Again, why? Again, because uh, they have enough time to educate, to inform the, the people about the virus. The wrong treatment about the virus will create uh, uh, the wrong uh, step as well to, to eliminate uh, the, or to fight uh, against this virus. So uh, these two important factors, enough time for preparedness and collective awareness on COVID-19 is the product or the result of their geographical locations. Now, uh, the next page. Uh, the second factor, the second key factor is that also contributes to the success of, uh, uh, of this country in eliminating the virus is the national leaderships. Uh, this country is led by uh, expertise. What does it mean? Uh, all regulations and rules produced by the governments and the parliaments are always based on science, data, and recommendations from the scientists and the experts. So, uh, uh, this leads to the, this leads to the birth of a very effective uh, rules and regulations, and uh, it also happens when uh, the terrorist uh, attack last year in the Christchurch. This country was so fast and was so effective in uh, deliberations, in deliberating uh, uh, required laws to uh, overcome uh, the crisis. And the loss in the regulations pro produced then, it's just the same. So uh, it was based on science, uh, recommendations, and data from the uh, uh, scientists 
uh, and also from uh, the experts. So the pictures you see, the, the pictures that you see on my presentations, they are not celebrities and they are not politicians. They are all doctors, they are all scientists, and they are all academics who every day give uh, recommendations, give inputs to the governments, to the prime ministers. Now their recommendations are then wrapped and then uh, 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 translated into rules and regulations which become umbrella for the uh, uh, for, for, for the government. Now, uh, the second one is the uh, mobilizing collective effort. Uh, to uh, fight against or uh, yeah, to fight against a crisis like a COVID-19, you cannot do it alone. We have uh, to establish uh, 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 coordinations and we have uh, to establish collaborations among all the stakeholders. Now here in New Zealand uh, is the champions because the government is able to manage collaborations with uh, 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 important stakeholders. Uh, for instance, uh, the government, the NGO, and also the medias. And I should say, when we talk about democracy, the pillars of democracy are all those. So the pillar of democracy is the government, uh, uh, the parliament, the media, and the, and the, uh, and, and NGO. Uh, in uh, overcoming this crisis, uh, interestingly, uh, the four elements of this democracy uh, can unite together. So they speak one language, uh, they help the government in overcoming the, the crisis as soon as possible. So when you ask me, uh, where is the position of the opposition? Opposition is there. And in, in fact, the opposition here in New Zealand is very strong. But in time of crisis like this, they chose to be constructive uh, oppositions rather than uh, destructive compositions, uh, destructive oppositions. And this is what I like from uh, uh, democracy in uh, this small country. So in a time like this, in a difficult time like this, togetherness is the key points. And whenever they are needed, they can mobilize themselves into one unit, into one strength, into one strength uh, to uh, overcome the crisis. And the third one is enabling coping. What I uh, really like from uh, the system which is implied here is the capability, the capability of the government in uh, enabling the people to cope uh, this uh, problem together. So uh, the government share the problem, share the difficulty with the people so that uh, everybody feels uh, responsible, so that everybody carries the same responsibility to uh, get out from the crisis uh, as soon as they can. The, uh, the third factor is strong border controls. So as we understand, uh, the virus, whatever you call it, moreover, the COVID-19 virus is a very dangerous virus and it's a very deadly. Uh, as long as the vaccine is not uh, invented yet, so the best medicine or the best way to overcome that is strong borders, and uh, the lockdown. Now, uh, this country has been very successfully in uh, implementing uh, borders uh, closing. So all borders has been closed since March 19, yeah, except for returning Kiwis. Uh, it is not easy for a country like New Zealand, whose main business is tourism, to close its borders. Because when the borders are closed, at the same time, the tourism is dead because there is no more international tourists. But uh, in this case, uh, they, priori they prioritize the safety and the health of the people than uh, anything else, uh, including economy. So closing the borders has been effectively, uh, 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 has been uh, very effective in uh, stopping uh, the import the import uh, the the uh, in stopping the uh, the virus that comes from uh, that comes from foreign countries 
As we understand that the virus cannot walk, so it cannot fly, it has to be brought by uh, a carrier, in this case, tourists. So uh, they made a very uh, stiff decisions to close the borders. And until now, even though we are now in level one, the borders remain closed. The second one is the, uh, is, is the lockdown. Uh, the lockdown is the, uh, is the way to uh, break the chains of infections in the community. And uh, borders closing and the lockdown contributes the most, with the most significant uh, factors in making the uh, spread of the virus in this country uh, highly uh, controllable. Uh, the fourth one is the, uh, I think this is very important, is the consistent and clear messaging. Uh, if not, then uh, people will get panic and uh, of course it will make the situation unstable and unconducive. So the cons uh, consistent and clear messaging, messaging uh, uh, physical distancing, personal hygiene and contact tracing, uh, this is the message that uh, has been all has, has always been conveyed by uh, the government yeah, from day to day to the people. And then I think this one is very interesting. During the lockdown, the message that they convey to us is safe at home, not stuck at home. And it it sounds simple, but I think it clears a very uh, different uh, different atmosphere being uh, between stuck at home and stay at home. And uh, it's a team of one, it's a team of five million. Uh, we know that the uh, population of New Zealand right now is five million. And the government has been successfully in engaging, uh, in embracing the, tol the total populations of uh, the country into a team. So it's the responsibility not only the responsibility of the government, but it's a response, uh, responsibility of everybody in New Zealand. And uh, the last one is the uh, protecting the vulnerable. Uh, we all understand that the most uh, vulnerable people uh, are the old people, the senior people. And for this, uh, the government gives a very special attention to these uh, people. They are very well taken care of and they are uh, very well monitored. Now, something very interesting in, in this page is that uh, in conveying the message to the public, uh, the government here only appoints two people and uh, they talk to the people every day, every afternoon. So the first one is the uh, prime minister herself uh, who talks about the uh, general views, uh, and the second one is the uh, Director General of Health, who speaks about data, who speaks about uh, health issues. And the combination of these two leaders give uh, how many to the people. Uh, uh, the people uh, here from day to day are well informed about what's going on. So there is no reason uh, to panic. So uh, I think this is one of the, uh, the, uh, the best secrets behind everything that uh, the consistent and clear messaging done by the same persons will contribute significantly to the success of the uh, eliminations. And the last one is the uh, people's participations. So point one, two, three, four do not mean a lot if people do not support. And uh, New Zealand should be proud of its people for being uh, well tested again, so many crises this year. The first one is the uh, uh, the Christchurch crisis, uh, in which they become united in uh, fighting against the uh, terrorists. And the second, as you know, it this country is uh, located on the ring of fire. Uh, they are shaken by uh, uh, earthquake almost every day. So, the, so uh, they are the people that are well tested with uh, conditions like that. And uh, the government is, uh, is not too difficult to make people understand on, on, on the sense on, on, or the meaning of the crisis itself. So uh, here, uh, during the crisis, during the lockdown, people you know, 
against the COVID-19. And when uh, we get to level one, which is close to normalcy right now, uh, people are united for the recovery. So as, as, as I understand here, people, you know, give a very strong support on government regulations and they follow all the uh, protocols. And I think uh, there are uh, five key factors behind uh, the success of the government of New Zealand in uh, fighting over the COVID-19 uh, 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 pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Wow. It was a great uh, presentation. And your Thank presentation uh, clearly give us a lot of learning about how to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic in New Zealand. And uh, what I noticed from your speech that they only faced uh, two big crises from uh, 2019 until 2020. But I don't know how many crises faced in Indonesia from 2019 and 2020. <laughs> well, that's very beautiful country. They only have two big crises only. And okay, I noticed some key points from your presentation. No, I'm, I'm, uh, I was talking about two big crises. If not yeah. doing well, you know, uh, they all have uh -huh. they all they all have potentials to uh -huh. uh, yeah to decrease the uh, the trust of the people. But as yeah, you know, it uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, from the yeah. two crises, uh, 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 the governments uh, became the champions, and as the reward, uh, the trust of the public towards them, you know, becomes uh, elevated. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador. And uh, as we know that at this time, several countries have started implementing new normal in the field health. Uh, economy, finance, transportation, and tourism, example like in Indonesia, as uh, we all know that uh, Indonesia is still fighting uh, against COVID-19 until now. And uh, we will discuss, Mr. Ambassador, and I will able, uh, elaborate with the question from uh, the audience. Uh, in your opinion, if we compare uh, to the normal in New Zealand and in Indonesia, what should have to do by the Indonesian government to get up uh, from the, the COVID-19 pandemic, especially in the field of the tourism, because as we all know that uh, Indonesia is one of the tourist destination from coming of uh, New Zealand's people. And uh, what, can you believe that uh, Indonesian government can absorb and uh, do what uh, adopt uh, New Zealand policy in a fighting in COVID-19 pandemic? A very good question. Uh, uh, New Zealand has been uh, one of uh, the two key uh, backbones of the economy of New Zealand. So uh, tourism and uh, agriculture. So uh, they are in the top positions uh, alternatingly. But for the last two, for the last two years, uh, tourism, uh, uh, com comfortably sits uh, uh, in the first rank as the first contributor to the uh, economy of uh, New Zealand. Like I said, when the borders close until now, so uh, the tourism is to tourism is that because uh, uh, yeah, in in many countries, uh, tourism uh, depends a lot on the international tourists. Now, from uh, mid-March, there is no more uh, interna international tourists that come to this country. But uh, there is a fact which is not uh, widely known by the people, is that in terms, of, uh, in terms of numbers, yes, international tourists contributes more than the local tourists. But in terms of value, in terms of spending, uh, domestic tourists contributes more than that of internet, international tourists. So this is very interesting. So uh, during the lockdown and during the crisis, uh, what, is, uh, what is done by the government of New Zealand is to enhance the New Zealanders, yeah, when the COVID is over, when the crisis is over, to immediately travel around the country. So the terms they use is visit your backyard. And 
The government always say to these people that this is the best time for you to visit your country while the tourists are not here. Uh, all right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, <laughs> That's great. That's great. Exactly. This is, uh, yeah. I mean, this is a very great uh, encouragement uh, from the government to its people. But on the other side, you know, uh, it does not only happen in Indonesia, in ASEAN country, but also it happens here in New Zealand and it happens in, I think it happens all over the world that there is a tendency of the industry to pay more attention to the international tourists than to the domestic tourists. All right. So uh, it happens also here. So uh, what is done by the government here is to uh, educate, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say, uh, to use uh, the word educate, to de educate the industry to uh, deal now, uh, uh, to, start, uh, to start to learn to deal with the uh, local tourists much better than in the past because the future is the local tourists. Uh, until now, uh, there is no uh, there is no indications that the borders will be reopened in a short time. So as long as the borders as long as the borders are still closed, so uh, uh, the tourists that can make uh, the industry viable is the domestic tourists. So you better be good to the domestic tourists. You you better serve them well. Now uh, we can feel it uh, when the uh, when the uh, when we went down to uh, level two and then level one, in which there is no more restric restrictions whatsoever, uh, the uh, tourist industry starts rolling again. Uh, the hotel booking and then ticket booking is uh, getting back, uh, is getting getting busy again. Uh, hotel, uh, cafe, restaurants are busy with customers and people start traveling. So from the sector of tourism, yeah, uh, from the sector of tourism, I can I can say here that the New Zealand economy is slowly back to normal. Not depends on the international tourists, but depends solely on the domestic tourists. Yes, Harold, are still with me? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. So I think what, what we can learn from New Zealand is that uh, uh, our uh, tourism industry uh, start to think that uh, their main market right now is the domestic market. Okay. Yeah. Uh, don't expect too much from a country like New Zealand because New Zealand has no plan to reopen its borders with uh, countries in the world. Uh, they will look at the facts very carefully be be before they make decisions on opening, on reopening uh, its borders with uh, a certain country. Uh, and uh, Indonesia is a big market. We are a country of 270 million. Say uh, if uh, we get 10% of our populations during traveling, it's more than 27 million, more than the uh, target of our tourists that we always hit to the world. So uh, I think, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, our concentrations right now is to the, to the uh, domestic or local market. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for your experience. I think, yeah, uh, I can imagine if uh, uh, New Zealand government will still uh, remain to close the border and uh, we still uh, have no idea when we, it will be reopened, right? Um, yeah, maybe it's uh, uh, the strategy, and I don't know what uh, Indonesian government can absorb and adopt this uh, policy. It's I think it's difficult. Uh, okay, uh, we have uh, four minutes left, and I will conclude from uh, this presentation. Uh, there are uh, three points that I noticed from uh, your presentation. Uh, the first is uh, the national leadership is needed to encourage people to be aware of the dangers of COVID-19 pandemic and to give uh, input policy to the government. And the second is strong border control is important as one of the strategy to control uh, COVID-19 pandemic. 
and the last uh, points, the one of the keys of the success in COVID-19 fighting is people participation to follow exactly. all the protocols. That's important, yeah. really important. Uh, I will give you two minutes, uh, Mr. Ambassador, to give uh, your uh, uh, the last statement and a concluding uh, statement. Okay. The first one is that we cannot compare the success of uh, New Zealand uh, in eliminating this COVID-19 with Indonesia. There are so many differences between us and New Zealand in terms of uh, size, in terms of populations, and then in terms of economic uh, uh, capability, we are very far different. And in terms of the uh, people readiness, we are so much different. So we cannot compare uh, New Zealand and Indonesia. It's like, uh, it's yeah. not uh, April to April. But I think there are uh, lessons learned from New Zealand. The first one that I would like to uh, underline once again is the participations from the people. Uh, uh, we can never get rid of this crisis uh, if we only depend on uh, the government. There is no way. So learning from New Zealand why they can get rid of this uh, crisis easily because of the collaborations. So uh, uh, everyone uh, uh, concerned, I mean, all uh, uh, stakeholders in the country should work together with the government. They have, we have to think together and we have to act together. So uh, the government should support the government, uh, the, the parliament should support the government and then the media. The media also becomes very uh, uh, important factors. I'm not saying that media only tells the good news, no, but the media has to implement self-censorship. They have to be able to uh, select uh, what news uh, that has uh, to, be, uh, uh, to be taken, right? Because more bad news, more negative news about Indonesia, they will create more worries for the people to come to Indonesia. And I think it's bad for the promotions, yeah? The good thing about New Zealand is that uh, people and, you, and the medias are united. Okay, they always talk about uh, positivity. They take. They always talk about optimism. Optimism, and I think uh, all all of them are read by people all over the world. So back in their mind here, when everything is over, when the COVID is over, one of the first countries that I would like to visit is New Zealand because it's safe there. Yeah, and the people is welcoming. And and the third one, if I still have a time, uh, COVID nineteen is very unprecedented. And uh, that what makes no government in the world is uh, prepared. So uh, we have to support the government. Yeah, the government has been trying very hard to fight against the virus. The government has been uh, doing all they can in order to get our countries get out from the crisis sooner rather than later. I mean, thank you very much. It's our hope uh, too, and thank you. Uh, Mr. Tanto, we are here for your kind and your time with us today. Hopefully, we, we stay safe there and keep healthy there. And hopefully, uh, Indonesian people in New Zealand will uh, pass this pandemic as well as uh, that we help. Thank okay, you. Uh, thank you for your time, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Stay and safe. We'll move to the next. Stay safe too, Mr. Ambassador. Salam alaikum. Aldila, can you hear me? Okay, Aldila, time is yours. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks to my friend, Mr. Khairul Anam, for giving me the time 
Uh, greetings, my name is Aldi Laputra Ramadan. I'm the president of PP Sri Lanka. I will moderate uh, for our uh, second session today. Uh, as a reminder, uh, there will be a Q&A session and discussion with the speakers after presentation. Uh, for those who have questions, you can ask, uh, you can write in the comments uh, your name, your country, and following with your questions. Uh, without waiting any longer, we invite the third speaker, or the second speaker, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, the ambassador of UAE, Ms. Mr. Hussein Bagis, the ambassador of United Arab Emirates. Time is yours. Okay, then, uh, I'm sorry, it's uh, for the second session, we'll uh, pause for a minute, then we'll, we'll be back later with the second session, uh, second speaker, the Ambassador of United Arab Emirates, Mr. Hussein Bagis. Thank you.
Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam. Apa kabar? Sehat Pak. Alhamdulillah. Eh, Pak Dubes sehat Pak. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Apa kabar? Keluarga baik semua. Alhamdulillah sehat Pak. Alhamdulillah. Eh, kita sudah on? Ya. Suara saya oke, okay. suara jelas. Jelas, jelas Pak Dubes. Alhamdulillah. Uh, mohon izin Pak Dubes masih menunggu rekan uh, moderator yang lain. Silakan. Okay. Hello sir, how are you? Fine. Alhamdulillah. So, hello, welcome everyone. Uh, greetings. Welcome back to uh, session two of uh, Ambassadors and Young Leader Week uh, 2020. Uh, now, uh, before we, we, are, we are going to start, continue the session, uh, I'll introduce myself. Myself is Aldila. I'm from PP Sri Lanka and uh, I'm moderating this uh, even now. Uh, for your reminder, uh, after, after the discussion with the three um, mm, speaker, we have a Q&A and discussion session. Um, therefore, if you have any question, you can write uh, in the comments, uh, write your name, where you're from, and the following questions. Okay, Mr. Hussein Bagis, the ambassador of uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, the time is yours. Uh, Excellency, Pak Umar Hadi, Indonesian ambassador to South Korea, Excellency Pak Chris, Indonesian Ambassador to Australia, and then uh, for the steering organizing committee for the Ambassador and Young Leader Weeks. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good afternoon. Uh, first of all, allow me to thank to the God, the Almighty, for His grace that we all could gather here through webinar held by the Overseas Indonesian Student Association Alliance. I really, really appreciate the initiative in this forum to share each other the best practices and also try to find the best solution to COVID-19 pandemic, which has carried out through the world. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought a significant impact to the other of life in the society, in the field of economic, social, culture, and etc. This uncertain situation makes us realize to enhance the cooperation with other countries. Accordingly, to combat this pandemic and to figure it out best mechanism to stop its spread. Even though the new normal has been implemented by the end of April 2020 for the government of Emirate is still applying a health protocol strictly and seriously. This policy reflects on continuation of national sterilization program from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., which is in line with the movement restriction between region policy. To implement the policy to use masks and gloves and to install the thermal camera everywhere. To apply a policy of social distancing and to provide hand sanitizer at many places in this area. These rules are mandatory and for those who don't obey to them will be penalized. At period of new normal, many public places such as mall, 
food court, restaurant, as well as the office and company have been reopened with the maximum 30% of occupancy and also the age of condition of people. Meanwhile, school, campus, place for worship, cinema, fitness center, amusement park, playground, playground, as well as public transportation are remain closed. In, in the middle of June 2020, the government of Dubai has implemented new normal by permitting 100% occupancy at the office, while Abu Dhabi still remain at the rate of 30%. The frequency of light inbound and outbound have been increasing as well as for the transit purpose. In fact, starting from 7 July 2020, Dubai will open commercial flight normally. Entering the new normal, many Indonesian citizens who experienced it by the unpaid leaves policy at the COVID-19 pandemic now are back to work. To show our concern, the Embassy of Indonesia in Abu Dhabi has given a humanitarian aid in the form of basic food and the mask for those who need them. As other countries, the economy of Emirates is certainly exposed by the spread of COVID-19 pandemic. As one of the global economic power, the biggest effect for the Emirates is related with some sectors such as traveling, trade, and business, which contribute around 80% from the total GDP. In the field of economy, the Central Bank of Emirates has announced its stimulus program to the bank with the amount around 27 billion US dollar. This is for government of Abu Dhabi. Meanwhile, the government of Dubai has announced its stimulus program with the amount around 200 million dollar for energy, trade, retail, and tourism. The government of Dubai also gives the assistance for a debt as well as for the exemption of service and guarantee scheme of credit for the small and medium businesses. While the bilateral cooperation between Indonesia and Emirates in all fields has been gone very, very well now, this cooperation include the G2G as well as with the private sector. Both countries discuss a cooperation in the field of education, culture, creative economy, trade, and investment. An example, the government of Emirates has been granted Indonesia with 20 ton medical equipment to handle the COVID-19 in Indonesia. And Indonesia also was agreed to help the Emirates with supply and sale of fruit and vegetable from small and medium companies. The impact of implementation of new normal in Emirates showed that economic sector has been moved well. Since the mall, restaurant, and other public places such as museum and park were reopened. Nonetheless, the government of Emirates is still implementing the policy for the movement of restriction between regions. Distance learning for students and worship place not to be reopened yet. The implementation of new normal by the government of Emirates is considered as the right thing to do to drive the economic sector. This also followed by the initiative in the field of health sector, where the government of Emirates is applying the policy to visit the citizen and providing the PCR test for free. This initiative is a collaboration between a health institution called SEHA and the police. At the transportation sector, the government of Emirates will open the inbound and outbound flight to Abu Dhabi and Dubai to support the growth economic and tourism sector. From the UAE best practices, there are some lessons learned as follows. 
strong support and commitment from the highest leader by making a priority for the safety and public health in domestic. Number two, applying miserable policy and law enforcement consistently. Three, do a public awareness campaign about the importance of procedure and health protocol to all citizens continuously. That's all that I can share with regarding the new normal procedure in Emirat and I do hope that we could benefit the lesson learned from Emirat for Indonesia. Thank you very much for your attention and wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullah. Uh, thank you so much, His Excellency. Uh, that was uh, enlightening, really enlightening, enlightening uh, presentation uh, regarding uh, United Arab Emirates during facing uh, COVID-19. And from what, what I can see is that, like more overall, most of the world they got impacted by the in the economy side, and uh, that's why most of the country they start to live a new normal, implement new normal in their countries. Yes. So, uh, thank you so much, sir, for your uh, presentation. It's really enlightening. And uh, thank you also for your time. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you, sir. And uh, thank you to Mr. Uh, Ambassador His Excellency, Mr. Rosin Bagis. Uh, now we are going to move on to uh, third speaker. Uh, His Excellency, uh, Mr. Uh, Christiarto Suryologo, the Ambassador of the Republic of Indonesia to Australia. Uh, I welcome him uh, to join us, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Can I be here? Can I can I be heard? Bisa kedengarkan enggak? Hello. Well, thank you Hello, so sir. much. How are you? Okay. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you clearly. Okay, well, well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Moderator. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. May the blessing of Allah Almighty be always upon all of us. And uh, first of all, I would like to greet also my colleague uh, who are joining this webinar, Pak Tontowi Yahya, our ambassador in New Zealand, Pak Umar Hadi, our ambassador in South Korea, and also uh, the previous speaker, my colleague Pak Hussein Bagis, the Indonesian ambassador to United Arab Emirates. And... I would like to uh, greet also all the participants of this webinar from around the globe. Uh, I would like to begin by uh, expressing my sincere appreciation to the Strategic Research and Movement Center of Overseas Indonesian Student Association Alliance for taking the initiative uh, to host this webinar. And since, I, since we all understand amidst this global pandemic, uh, the issue that's been raised uh, is very relevant to all of us. Uh, I would like to underline uh, that the topic is not only relevant to the challenges that we have before us nowadays, but also very useful also uh, for all of us in educating uh, our public as well as uh, setting the light for concrete solution in dealing with this global pandemic. Um, allow me to start by reiterating, again, reiterating what Bapak Presiden and Ibu Menlu have mentioned, that these current global challenges are immense and unprecedented. This pandemic has forced everyone to take extra miles to effectively deal with our own domestic need and situation. And I would like to emphasize that no single individual, no single community, no single country uh, is able to deal with this global pandemic alone. So 
uh, by saying this, actually I would like to emphasize that people out there, people out there will not succeed without our participation. People, not the, uh, people out there will not succeed if we do not play our role. And of course, uh, as requested, and also in line with my capacity as the Indonesian ambassador to Australia, I would like to, to talk a bit about the current state of this global pandemic here in Australia and how the Australian uh, authority uh, is addressing uh, the issue. Australia has been quite successful in handling this COVID-19 pandemic. And perhaps uh, because of this, we could learn also uh, from the experience of Australia, although I need to emphasize also, I need to emphasize that there's no one size fits all formula. And what is being implemented here in Australia uh, cannot be immediately implemented in Indonesia. Now about the current status. As of yesterday, 23rd of June 2020, there were recorded 7,492 cases with total casualties 102 and those who have recovered, uh, the number is amounting to 6,915 with total tests conducted uh, amounting to 2,132,821, one of the highest test per capita rate in the world. Since the first case detected on the late of January 2020, Australia has taken several measures such as stricter border control and risk travel advice level to a number of countries. At the beginning of March, as we all understand, Prime Minister Scott Morrison banned all non-citizen and non-resident to enter Australia as well as maximize travel advisory from uh, travel warning to travel ban. So no Australian citizen is allowed to go overseas. And this has been followed also by uh, the Governor General declarations on human biosecurity emergency on the mid of March that effectively closed all the schools, non-essentials, indoor and outdoor gathering, as well as non-essential services. And on this, I think they impose also a hefty fines to those who breach all the health protocols. And on the 4th of April, Australian government strongly advised that all temporary visa holders, including international students, that are unable to maintain their livelihood for the next six months in Australia, they've been advised to leave Australia immediately. Again, uh, don't get me wrong, this is only an advice. And actually many Indonesian students also, they remain uh, to stay in Australia uh, because at the end they, 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 they have been well assisted also by the local authority, by the university uh, where they study and also uh, they've been supported and assisted also by all the Indonesian uh, representative office all over Australia such as the embassy in Canberra, our consulate general in Sydney, Melbourne, in Perth and also the one uh, in Darwin. And in the mid-April, even though the flattening of the curve had been showing good progress, the government has announced that social and physical distancing policy will be maintained. And furthermore, the Australian government has cancelled also some mass gathering events such as uh, all the big events uh, like a Florida festival in Canberra, all the sport events that used to be very popular also in Australia, everything's been uh, cancelled. Um, and this global pandemic has, has uh, affected also the economy of Australia. I think the cost of this uh, global pandemic has reached more than 3.4 billion Australian dollars 
So to address this, Australia, Australian government, as uh, any other country in the world, they have issued also some string of financial uh, stimulus uh, amounting to 326 uh, uh, billion Australian dollar. And as we all understand, Australia are a federal country with eight states. So we could see also that at the national level, the government has adopted a policy, a federal policy, but the implementation, the, impl the implementation at the end, uh, at every stage, will depend on the, on the status of this global pandemic in that respective uh, state. For instance, in Northern Territory, with no new cases in three weeks, and there are no more restriction on playground, uh, wedding, uh, funeral, and non-context, but still, still, again, they have to maintain uh, some, and they have to adhere also to some uh, very strict uh, health protocols. And although actually in terms of easing the restriction, Australia now uh, is in stage two of re restricting, uh, easing the restriction, easing the restriction. But as we all understand, since there have been new cases uh, uh, in the last few days in Victoria, I think uh, the state of Victoria has again, uh, again uh, make all the restriction uh, in place again. And, but in any other state like in the ACT, in, the, in Northern Territory, as I mentioned, in Western Australia, in uh, South Australia, I think they are now in stage two of easing the restriction. And this, uh, if the evaluation of this stage two is positive, uh, in the mid of July, they will enter the stage three of easing the restriction, meaning that more activities uh, involving more people uh, will be allowed. But again, again, uh, everyone still have to adhere to a very strict uh, health protocol that has been imposed since the beginning of this uh, pandemic. And of course, uh, being the Indonesian ambassador to Australia, one of our main uh, tasks is to look after the Indonesian citizens uh, in Australia. Uh, so far, so far, uh, I could mention that there are only two cases involving uh, Indonesian citizens. Uh, there are two Indonesian citizens being uh, infected, but they have fully recovered. As uh, you understand, we have now around 15,509 Indonesian students uh, studying in various universities in Australia. And of course, they have been uh, affected very much financially, in particular, uh, since they, some, many of them uh, to support their life in Australia, they have to take part-time jobs. But since they could not, they, they could no longer work, then uh, they lost a lot of incomes. So on this particular issue, actually, together with uh, all the Indonesian, uh, with all the ASEAN ambassador in Australia, we have written a letter to all minister for education in every state uh, and to all vice chancellor in all universities where we have as, as students from ASEAN countries for them to, to look after, to protect and to assist uh, students from ASEAN countries. And the feedback is quite encouraging. Uh, they, they are, I, we receive a lot of uh, encouraging responses from all the universities. Uh, giving assurances that they are really looking after students, international students, in particular those coming from, from uh, ASEAN countries. 
And the other category of the Indonesian citizen who live in Australia are those who are in Australia under working holiday visa. And many of them have been affected because they lost their job while actual, uh, at the same time, it is not easy for them also to immediately go back to Indonesia. On this, actually, uh, all the uh, uh, Indonesian uh, representative offices all over Australia uh, try to always stay connected with them and always over any uh, assistance that uh, they need to so for them they could uh, address all the issues that they have uh, before them and on this together with my colleague uh, in sydney in melbourne in perth in uh, darwin also uh, we we have uh, given also some logistical uh, support and this has been a very highly appreciated uh, by them and i would like to convey also that during the ramadan during the ramadan we have done our best also uh, although we could not for example conduct the we could not conduct the solat eid and uh, we could not uh, uh, conduct uh, the solat maghrib uh, together but we want to to bring the spirit of ramadan still among the Indonesian uh, uh, community here. Uh, so we conducted a lot of programs through webinar and we have conducted also the, the, uh, the distribution of Takjil uh, through a drive uh, through method. And this is something also that's been uh, highly appreciated by the Indonesian community here. So now about the new normal. With the new normal, actually, uh, we have to establish new habits. What is the significance? It means that we have to think what we have to stop doing. And at the same time, we have to think also what kind of things that we have to do amidst this global pandemic so we could play our positive role Again, we could play our positive role in helping uh, all the, 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 the government and the community also in preventing this global pandemic from uh, spreading further. And as I mentioned uh, before, that no individual, no individual community, no individual country will be able to handle this global pandemic alone. We need to stay united. We need to stay together. We have to render uh, our assistance to those who are really in need. But at the same time also, we have to play our part by, again, stick to all the health protocol that has been introduced by all the relevant authorities wherever we are, wherever we are, because every country has different uh, social setting, they have different uh, economic uh, capabilities. So again, people out there will not succeed without our participation. But I do believe that at the end, we will be able to win this war again, if we manage if we succeed in strengthening our solidarity and cooperation i think that's all that i would like to share in this webinar and i will i will make myself available for question and answer at the later stage thank you so much mr moderator assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Waalaikumsalam warahmatullah. Thank you so much, uh, His Excellency, uh, Mr. Uh, Chris, the Ambassador to Australia, Indonesian Embassy. Uh, we are so glad that uh, we knew that uh, how the Embassy uh, assisted the uh, Indonesian uh, citizen in Australia and uh, how Australia uh, fighting against the coronavirus. 
and obviously as as you say that it's uh, everyone's participation it's not just the medical team government it's everyone's participation they have to do their thing so uh, i would like to thank you for your time and uh we'll see you again in a q and a question thank you so much okay we'll move on to the fourth speaker it's uh ambassador extraordinary and plenipotentiary of the republic uh, of indonesia to south korea uh, his excellency uh, mr umar hadi i would like to invite him to the stage hello 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 sir <laughs> how are you good how are you Good, I'm good. Thanks. Time is yours, sir. Okay, thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening to everyone uh, in this webinar. Um, first of all, I should like to say that I'm very happy that uh, Indonesian students uh, from all over the world have taken this initiative uh, to educate themselves about uh, COVID-19 and uh, the new normal, the so-called new normal. I believe it is a common uh, knowledge already that uh, the country of South Korea or the Republic of Korea has been acknowledged uh, by many people, many countries as one of the successful countries uh, in uh, dealing with this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but I would like to underline uh, something perhaps uh, more important than simply dealing successfully with the pandemic but in South Korea, in my observation, uh, this country has been able to do it to successfully mitigate the pandemic while maintaining their democracy and democratic institutions. This is a very important point to underline. Um, one of the uh, one of the things that uh, we can see is that on April the 15th, uh, South Korea uh, was very successful in organizing its parliamentary elections. So even uh, during the public health crisis, uh, they organized a national election uh, to elect uh, members of the parliament and it was very successful. Uh, I remember at a time after the uh, polling, after the elections, there was no uh, new infections, not too many new infections. So. It, the the, uh, the number of new cases did not uh, jump because of the elections. How? Because uh, they put in place a very strict uh, health and quarantine gu guidelines uh, for the elections. And then the results of the elections uh, proved that the ruling party, uh, it's called the uh, Korea Democratic Party, uh, it won the elections uh, by a clean slate. Uh, so, uh, I mean, landslide. Uh, they, they won big. Uh, they, they won very big in the elections. So now they, uh, they also uh, dominate the number of uh, the members of, of the parliament from that party. And it means that 
the people of South Korea uh, has uh, accepted and welcomed and uh, the work of the government in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic and they uh, place uh, very uh, they place the, their trust to the current government so having said that I should like to illustrate a little bit what has been going on since January um, the first uh, COVID-19 case in South Korea was announced on uh, January the 20th right? and it was a uh, tourist uh, from uh, China uh, for the next uh, 28 days until uh, February uh, the 18th uh, the it seemed that the COVID-19 um, was under control because the number of cases from the uh, case number one on January 20th to February 18th was only 34 cases uh, but then it, it has been well documented uh, in the city of Daegu this is a city uh, about 250 kilometers uh, south from the city of Seoul so it's uh, more or less in the middle of, of uh, South Korea uh, they found uh, the I mean the uh, National Health Authority founded uh, they found uh, uh, a cluster uh, from a religious uh, sect uh, that basically uh, became what they call the super spreader so suddenly since uh, February uh, 20th the number of new cases uh, especially in that city of Daegu uh, grew exponentially uh, and the peak of that uh, new cases was on February 29 uh, there was uh, about 900 uh, more than 900 new cases in one day but uh, the health authority in South Korea uh, acted quickly uh, through uh, what they call three T's uh, testing uh, tracing and treatment so in a very short uh, relatively short time in about three weeks they were able to uh, how do you say it? Uh, uh, the curve, uh, the growth of the new cases uh, has been uh, tampered. Uh, so slowly but surely, uh, the number of new cases is growing uh, smaller and smaller every day. Until uh, about the end of April, uh, the government decided to uh, by the way, uh, through all this uh, outbreak in uh, in Daegu City, uh, South Korea uh, has been persistent not to place a uh, lockdown. They only put the social distancing uh, campaign, right? Uh, meaning you can still travel uh, to any city in Korea, uh, but the uh, public transportation still uh, in operation uh, you can go to restaurants uh, but uh, you can go to uh, all kinds of places uh, but there are some uh, quarantine measures or guidelines that you need to follow such as wearing face mask uh, uh, try to avoid uh, large-scale uh, gatherings uh, you should wash your hands uh, frequently and so on and so forth 
except for those living in the city of Daegu and the surrounding areas. They are advised uh, for a few weeks uh, to stay at home as much as possible. So as I said, uh, uh, by the end of April, uh, the number of new cases uh, every day has, have, has grown smaller and smaller until for about one week, we had only one new case or even zero. So one digit new case, below 10 new cases. So on the 6th of May, uh, the government of South Korea decided to uh, ease up, to, to place a relaxation on the social distancing campaign. Uh, so I remember uh, by early May, people were very, very happy because it means they could go to the park, they could go, they, they thought, I think they, they could go back to their normal life. I remember because uh, I always asked uh, Indonesians living in South Korea, uh, there are about 37,000 of us. Uh, I, I, I gave out a video message saying that, please don't think that you can go back to your normal life. Instead, you are moving forward to a new normal that is uh, a more healthier and more productive life. So 6th of May, relaxation of social distancing. And then as it was already actually anticipated and ex expected, we found that the number of cases uh, going back to uh, the range is between 30 to 70. So from one digit below 10, after relaxation, what we call new normal, uh, the cases are growing again uh, until today. So on the 29th of May, the government, especially in the city of Seoul, and its surrounding area now, uh, they place again some uh, restrictions, such as they are closing down the museums and so on and so forth. Uh, but the, the thing is, uh, I think in South Korea, both the government and the people, they really want and they need to get out of this uh, pandemic uh, as soon as possible. Why? Uh, because South Korea as a country is heavily dependent on international trade. Uh, international trade contribute about 70% of the South Korean uh, economy. That's why a mobility of the people, especially business people, is very, very important. Now, uh, my last point is about uh, students. In South Korea, we have about 1,500 Indonesian students. Uh, since February or uh, since March, actually, uh, the uh, the students, they most of them uh, have an online study, so no class studies. But uh, since May, uh, I think uh, some of, of them, especially for the master's degree and the PhD uh, level, they already started uh, classes. But uh, during uh, these times, uh, the whole uh, pandemic, uh, the labs uh, are still working, still open. So uh, for PhD students especially, actually they still have to go to the labs uh, to do their research. So, and um, thankfully, uh, Indonesians living in South Korea, uh, 
we are quite uh, very we have a good communication with uh, one another especially the students uh, so that uh, until today uh, among students uh, we have no uh, case of infect infection just uh, for uh, information uh, today uh, in South Korea, all confirmed case is 12,535, but already released from the hospital uh, is 10,930. Uh, death is 281. Uh, still undergoing treatment at the hospital, 1,324. Uh, and uh, the tests that they uh, they have conducted uh, since January the third until today is at one million two hundred and eight thousand tests. Uh, so that is uh, in South Korea. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for your explanation. It's clearly how uh, COVID-19 has started in the Korea, in South Korea, and how the second wave happened, and uh, how Indonesian embassy assisted the uh, Indonesian citizen in Korea, and uh, of course the student also. And now I would like to invite my colleague, uh, Mr. Khairul Anam, and also uh, His Excellency, the Ambassador of uh, Republic of Indonesia, to um, United Arab Emirates and also His Excellency uh, the Ambassador of the Republic of Indonesia to Australia. Assalamualaikum. Right. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Now come. Uh, thank you for everyone. Uh, now we are moving on to uh, next session, which is uh, this discussion and also Q and A question. That if uh, the participant or the audience they have uh, any questions, written in the comments. And, uh, please, Mr. Mr. Erwan. Okay. Uh, thank you for the time uh, of the Laputra Ramadan. Uh, I have uh, two questions for uh, the ambassador of uh, uh, Republic of Indonesia to Australia and uh, to United uh, Arab Emirates. Uh, the first question to Mr. Uh, Hussein Bagis. Uh, at the moment, uh, does the United Emirates Arab uh, suffer due to the low demand of the oil and uh, aviation industry impact of uh, pandemic COVID-19? And for uh, the ambassador of the Republic Indonesia to Australia, uh, I noticed uh, your presentation about the new normal life in Australia. and. Uh, how long the transition period going to the new normal will be implemented in Australia? And can you show us uh, the impact of Australia government policy about the international traveling to Indonesian tourism? Because we just heard from Mr. Tantawi Yahya that New Zealand will close the borders until unknown time. I'm afraid that it will happen in Australia too. Please give your opinion, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. First, please, Baba. Yes, uh, thank you for your question regarding Emirate. As uh, as far as you know that uh, Abu Dhabi, I think uh, they have reduced daily 4 million barrel crude oil. Mm -hmm. right? And then uh, the population or the local population for Abu Dhabi, more or less than 1 million people. So uh, I think not so big problem regarding the, the, the price of the energy uh, decrease recently. And then because they have a lot of money, 
everywhere mm-hmm. in, in Europe, everywhere. Only on Dubai, yes. Therefore, they try not to open Dubai as soon as possible in order to attract the tourists, trade, and finance also. So for Abu Dhabi, so far, I think it's not, not so big problem regarding the economy, pandemic. Okay. Thank you. So it, it, uh, so it is possible uh, the tourism to enter the Abu Dhabi, maybe uh, in the uh, soon uh, the time? Or... Yes, of course. If you get visa to enter Dubai, you can come to Abu Dhabi to okay. Sarjan to every Emirate in, in Emirate. Okay, that's great news for us. <laughs> uh, my second uh, question to uh, the ambassador of uh, Republic Indonesia to Australia. Well, thank you very much for the question. As I mentioned before, uh, we are now in stage two, stage two of easing the restric- uh, restriction. And uh, the stage two will be until mid of July, but whether or not, whether or not Australia will enter to stage three of easing the restrictions, uh, it will very much depend on the evaluations of the implementations of the stage two. Uh, for example, what happened in Victoria? Uh, Victoria has been in stage two also of easing the restriction, but since there have been some new cases, so actually uh, they have not put some of the restriction that in place. So again. This, this will very much depend on the evaluation of the result of the implementation of the stage two of easing restrictions. About uh, the possibility of Australian citizens to travel overseas, including to Indonesia. Uh, until now, uh, the Australian government still imposed the travel ban to all Australia to travel overseas, but only under the strict uh, conditions. Uh, some Australians are allowed to travel to certain countries. For example, uh, we have received uh, application uh, for a visa for an Australian citizen uh, who, to look after member of the family, this family who live in Bali. So we process the uh, visa application, but at the same time also, this particular individual also has to get the permission from the Australian border force for them, uh, for him to be allowed to travel to Indonesia. So under special circumstances, so they still allowed to uh, to travel uh, overseas, including to Indonesia, but. For uh, tourism purposes, uh, I think there has been a very clear announcement given by the uh, Australian Minister for Trade and Tourism that Australians are not yet allowed to travel overseas. If the stage three is implemented, uh, some Australians will be allowed to travel only to New Zealand and to some countries uh, in the Pacific. So, but again, this will depend on their evaluations of the implementations of uh, state uh, two of ESIC restriction. Again, definitely, uh, this will impact the uh, tourism industry in Indonesia, in particular Bali, because Australians have contributed a lot to the development of the tourist uh, industry in Bali. But uh, I've, uh, we have a lot of discussion with all the relevant stakeholders in Bali on how we could prepare Bali post, uh, post uh, this global pandemic. So when all the restrictions are lifted, Bali is been ready. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Okay. Uh, now, now uh, let me uh, give the opportunity for me to uh, ask a question to the ambassador of uh, 
Republic of Indonesia to the Republic of Korea. Uh, that, uh, my question is that uh, we understand that uh, now Korea is facing a second wave of the pandemic. So uh, my question is, uh, what things should Indonesia could learn from Korea uh, to prevent that? And what are the opportunities and challenges in the implement implementing of the strategies? Um, there are three uh, things that uh, we can observe from South Korea. Number one is high level of preparedness. Right? So, uh, especially for the public health authority. In Korea, they have what they call Korea Center for uh, Disease Control and Prevention, so KCDC. So this uh, body, this agency, uh, is responsible to ensure that in uh, all the territory of uh, South Korea, uh, all the hospitals are ready, the medical professionals are ready, the equipments, uh, the testing capacity, and, and uh, so everything is uh, very well prepared. Uh, I can give you an example, uh, just uh, two weeks ago, so in this new normal phase, uh, you can have uh, suddenly uh, a notification in your handphone, right, uh, from the local authority. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, there is a building uh, nearby the embassy, I think about 200 meters away from the embassy. Uh, whereby uh, at the basement of the building, there is a very good Thai restaurant and the fried rice is very nice. So many of uh, the staff at the embassy, they like having lunch in that place. But one day uh, we got this notification. So in Korea, we have this automatic uh, notification in our handphones from time to time. So one day we get this notification saying that those who are in this building uh, on the, these dates uh, should go to the nearest uh, testing stations to get the COVID-19 test. <laughs> so now uh, uh, in each uh, office, uh, including at the embassy, we have to uh, appoint uh, a person uh, what we call quarantine manager. So that person is tasked to uh, uh, gather information from all the staff at the embassy who uh, among them uh, were at that building for lunch uh, during the dates uh, mentioned in the notification. So we gathered, uh, apparently there, are, there were seven uh, people who were there for lunch uh, on those three dates. So uh, they went to, there, there, were, there are two uh, testing stations in uh, our district. Uh, one has the capacity of 850 people or tests per day. The other one is 200 uh, tests per day. So because apparently uh, the restaurant in, in that building uh, is very popular, suddenly so many people are doing a testing that day so over over overcrowded uh, so the seven uh, embassy staff they couldn't get uh, their test uh, the day and then the next morning uh, I, I remember it was a saturday uh, there is a park uh, next to the embassy suddenly in the morning uh, they already erected the uh, uh, temporary tents uh, as a temporary testing stations that can test 2,000 people per day. So can you imagine in a very fast uh, manner, uh, it happens very fast so that there is a very high level of preparedness. And uh, the building uh, involved uh, that day it was isolated and uh, the local authority also uh, sterilized the building 
So the next day, uh, after all the testing, uh, uh, the the restaurants and the building uh, was back uh, open again. So you can now you can have lunch in that restaurant again, that Thai restaurant for the nasi goreng. So that kind of preparedness uh, with the information technologies, the notifications, uh, the very fast uh, uh, measures uh, taken by the local authority. And it, they're doing it uh, to the very local level, uh, and district level. So that's number one, high level preparedness. Uh, number two uh, is what I call uh, policy coherence. Uh, so in South Korea, uh, both horizontally between different uh, ministries and agencies and also vertically uh, from the president up to the head of a village or head of a district, uh, they, have, uh, uh, they have the same policies and the same approach because all decisions, all policies taken uh, is based on uh, scientific uh, data and facts provided by the uh, public health authority, what they call the KCDC. Right? So therefore, uh, the level of uh, policy coherence in South Korea is also very, very high. And the third factor is what we call public trust and public participation. So because of the preparedness and the policy coherence, at the end, the, the public in South Korea, they place a very high uh, trust uh, to their government, uh, to the ability of the government to uh, to address this uh, global pandemic. And this has been proven by the fact that the ruling party, the current government, won uh, uh, the, the elections on April 15. So I think uh, uh, the third factor, uh, public trust and public participation is very important. And I think if uh, you can strike the right balance uh, between uh, the need to uh, keep uh, the population uh, safe, right? but at the same time also the need for the population to do about their daily uh, business uh, for their livelihood. Uh, at that time, you can find that uh, there is a sense of uh, responsibility that is shared by everybody, both the people in the government and, and, and the general public. I think that's uh, the three most important things that we should observe. Okay, that's great. Uh, uh, Mr. Aldila, uh, can I ask uh, one question more? Uh, I will back to Mr. Uh, uh, Cristiarto, uh, the Embassy of the Republic of Indonesia to Australia. I'm interested in your explanation uh, about uh, the policy of Australian government to temporarily ban uh, Australian people travel to overseas, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, is there an attempt or diplomacy communication from uh, Indonesian government to contact uh, the relevant parties in the Australian government to reopen the path of the tourists coming to Indonesia uh, in the near of the future? Because we all know that uh, Australia is one of the biggest countries that uh, contribute the large number of tourists uh, to come to Indonesia. Thank you for, for your question. There has been some communication uh with our australian com counterpart also but everything will will very much depend on first the the situation in indonesia of course and also the situation in uh australia 
and hopefully hopefully because as you understand also uh, starting from the 5th of July 2020 uh, all the long awaited economic partnership agreement between Indonesia and Australia will come into effect because both parliaments uh, uh, Indonesian parliament and also Australian parliament have ratified the agreements and one of the elements of of this agreement is about facilitating the movement of people people coming from australia to indonesia and also people from indonesia to come to australia and uh, including also uh, those who will be visiting uh, indonesia uh, as tourists but again again this is uh, what is happening now is something that is really unprecedented so every country has I agree. Uh, every country has taken a, a lot of uh, pre, uh, precaution uh, measures and uh, we have to I'm not speaking on behalf of the Australian authority but again we, we fully understand all the measures that's been taken by uh, Australia because it is policy that is valid across the board. It is not uh, targeting. Uh, it is not targeted to certain individual country. Uh, for example, Indonesia. This is a policy that's been uh, adopted across the board. So until now, uh, the the Australian authority uh, does uh, still still uh, ban any Australian citizen to uh to travel overseas but again again i've been in uh in communication with some uh, relevant uh, stakeholders in bali on how to prepare bali uh, so once for example this pandemic is over we do hope that bali is prepared to receive again tourists from all over the world including including those who will be coming from australia Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Ambassador, for your explanation. And I will move to uh, uh, Mr. Hussein Bagis. Uh, I uh, have read that China is testing the COVID-19 uh, vaccine uh, in the United Arab Emirates. As far as you know, how is the development of the vaccine and uh, when it can be mass produced? Yes, uh, actually, actually, Emirate uh, has made cooperation with Chinese. Uh, they, they, they now try to build a kind of lesser system to, to, copy, to check the COVID test. This is what we will like, we will do also in my country Indonesia. Now they're still talking about cooperation with Indopharma. Hopefully, uh, hopefully this project will be launching on 15 of July next month in Jakarta. It's so special system check pandemic using computer with laser. This is what we we know here. Okay. Inshallah. Uh, can we pre can we predict uh, when it can be mass produced? Maybe uh, 20, uh, 21 or it, it might be uh, I think on September we will we will we will use in my country Indonesia. Oh, okay. September. That's good news for us. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, Aldila, back to you. Okay, okay thank you, uh, Mr. Khairul Anam. Uh, now, uh, and thank you also to all the ambassadors present here. And uh, now we are going to move on to uh, next session, which is a uh, closing statement and conclusion. Uh, after all, the presentation of the ambassadors, we can, we can understand that people awareness uh, how people see uh, 
regarding the pandemic, it's it's really important. Uh, they have to be aware that they also play part for everything. And uh, most of the ambassadors also mentioned that high level of preparedness, policy coherence between the governance and the stakeholders, and also the uh, again public awareness. So uh, that's re that's really important. And hopefully with this uh, event, we can uh, understand and the people can understand how important uh, people uh, participation is. Uh, and lastly, I want to invite the uh, ambassadors to make their uh, closing statement. Uh, first, uh, we can go to uh, His Excellency, the Ambassador to the Republic of Indonesia of United Arab Emirates, Mr. Hussein Bagis. The time is yours. Uh, thank you for PPI Dunia. And my closing statement for our love country Indonesia, firstly, we must apply measurable policy and technology and more law enforcement for the people. This, number two, we must do a public awareness campaign about the importance of health protocol to all citizens. Number three is very, very important also that we must always and forever doa to the God, inshallah, Corona will go away and finish. Thank dan salam sehat and subhanallah wa subhanallah khair in Abu Dhabi. Amin, amin. Amin, amin. Okay. And next, uh, thank you, uh, His Excellency, Mr. Rosin Bagis, the Ambassador of uh, Republic of Indonesia to UAE. Now, uh, I would like to invite uh, the Ambassador of uh, Republic of Indonesia to Australia, uh, Mr. Chris, uh, your, your time is yours. Time is yours. If, uh, closing remark. Again, I would like to reiterate what our president has mentioned. Uh, this global pandemic is uh, is not something that we can take it lightly, but at the same time, we don't have to panic. So what we have to do, let's stay united. And then, because again, as I mentioned before, uh, everybody has to do their part. Everybody has to contribute. For us, uh, to get, uh, for us, uh, together to deal with this global pandemic. Even if, for example, we have to, we have already achieved something. Again, complacent is not an option because, as uh, Ambassador Umar Hadi mentioned before, the second wave of this uh, pandemic is something that uh, we can uh, we cannot take it uh, very lightly. Also, so I think just uh, we have to to lend a hand to everyone. Uh, stay safe, uh, stay healthy, and again, stay united. Thank you so much once again for the initiative uh, of holding this uh, webinar. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chris. And now uh, I would like to invite His Excellency the Ambassador of the Republic of Indonesia to the Republic of Korea. Time is yours. Uh, first of all, I would agree with both Ambassador Hussein uh, Bagis Hussein and Ambassador Cristiarto uh, about uh, the importance of taking this COVID-19 pandemic seriously and we have to put our best efforts uh, to put this uh, to, uh, at the stop. And at the same time, I think especially for a young generation, you know, uh, you are at your 20s and 30s. I think today uh, this is a very challenging, but at the same time, very exciting times, right? Because this global pandemic will be noted in human history as something very important, uh, a watershed that will change uh, the rest of our lives, uh, the, the rest of human history. How we adjust and adapt ourselves to the new situation and what we decide to do uh, today 
will uh, eventually influence what kind of future that we will have right and to me i think we simply cannot go back to our previous way of life to the normal life because it is clear that we need to build a better way of living uh, we need to have better policies when it comes to uh, climate change and the environment for example we need to build up better technology uh, to help us uh, humans uh, to live our lives in a better safer healthier and more productive way thank you very much All right. Uh, thank you for the excellent and the great closing statement. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, our time is up. Uh, I would like to thank all the ambassadors who uh, spared their time to come and speak with us, and also my colleagues, uh, Mr. Hoyl Anam. Thanks for being here. And uh, finally, I return the event to the Master of Ceremony and will close our agenda today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pak Omar, Pak Bagis, yeah. stay healthy, please. Stay safe, yeah. stay healthy. Yeah. And stay, stay united. Yeah. That's fighting. Yeah. Fighting COVID-19. Yeah. Fighting COVID-19. Thank you very much to all the speakers. Inshallah. Thank you. Once again, thank you very much to all the speakers, moderators, and viewers who were willing to attend from the beginning to the end of the event. A high appreciation for all organizing committee, our sporting team, and also our media partner. Before I close the event, I would like to inform everyone one last time that we are also raising funds for COVID-19, especially for our medical team who are at the forefront in fighting COVID-19. If you want to donate, please refer to the bank account number or scan the QR code as shown below on your screen. Thank you very much to all of you who have contributed to the, to the donation. Don't forget, we still have another event waiting for you. See you in our next event. Bye. Bye-bye.